Yeah, hello. Good morning, everyone. It's a nice weather outside. Maybe it's moving, but you should go out. Temperature is very good. Uh, thank you for showing up uh, to the SDSS seminar. Uh, the lunch is lunch will be here in short while. Uh, we talk when they are out to get some lunch for you. Okay, so first off, we have Professor Jingbo Liu with us. Uh, today, he'll be talking about the current research uh, in convex geometry, empirical processes, and solution to covers problem, and maybe some uh, future directions that we might be interested in in these problems. So let's welcome Professor Liu. Thank you. Hey, hello, everyone. Welcome to the seminar. And I would like to express my thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation. And it's also nice to see all of you here. I know some of you have taken my classes before, so it's nice to see you again. So this, uh, um, let me maybe turn off the, okay. Volume, okay. Okay, so this, uh, this talk is about the story of this talk is about the story of how I solved the, a problem in information theory and uh, how I picked up some knowledge about convex geometry and the empirical process during this journey. So uh, the problem we are looking at is this uh, a rally channel, really channel problem. So uh, in 1987, there was a book called uh, Open Problems in Communication and Com Computation published by Springer Balak. And in this uh, book, Tom Cover asked uh, this question about the Rayleigh really channel. So um, Tom Cover is not only a general award winner, but also arguably the one of the most uh, famous, uh, one of the most important information theorists after Shannon. So if you want to learn a, a course on information theory, probably the first textbook you will pick up is the book by Tom Cover on elements on, of information theory. So uh, and on the other side, uh, Rayleigh channel is a, is a very simple channel model a symbol as this picture shows. However, the, the capacity region for this channel is still unknown to this day. So intuitively, you have a transmitter called X and the, the goal is to transmit a message to the destination called Y2. There is a node in the middle called Y1, which is called the relay. So the relay is used to help you send a message to the intended destination. I will not go to the details about this channel model, but uh, I just want to uh, mention that uh, this, this capacity region is still unknown, but uh, Tom Cover asked a specific question about this region. So, so he said, uh, if we do not know the full capacity region, can we know some important feature about this capacity region? So he defined this notion of critical value of C0 such that uh, this this curve will have a turn. So you can think of this critical value C0 as some, some important feature about this capacity region. But this uh, seemingly simple question is still unsolved uh, until recently. And I will just mention that uh, there are many 
past and recent works on this covers problem. This is just a partial list. A lot of top people in information theory have worked on this problem and uh, many interesting mathematical tools such as concentration of measure, rearrangement inequality, reverse hypercontractivity, optimal transport, and uh, traditional auxiliary random variable approach in information theory have all been applied to this problem, but all these techniques only solved the problem for some special cases, such as the, the case of binary symmetric channel or Gaussian channel, or uh, more recently by these people for channels which have a, a low rank matrix representation. But the, the general question were, were not solved. Uh, uh, recently, in my work, I introduced a new technique based on convex geometry ideas, which is published on a probability theory journal. And the, this uh, give a first uh, solution to this problem. So the, uh, roughly speaking, the, the result is that the critical region, the uh, critical rate is expressed as this conditional entropy where Z underlying and Y underlying are some functions explicitly defined in my paper. So I just want to say that uh, the, the answer actually has a very simple expression. And for the remaining parts of this talk, I just wanted to, to mention some of the main ideas for the proof and how they are related to geometry and the empirical process. So the idea is to, to provide some novel connections between information theory quantities, which can be also thought of as the KL divergence or certain partition functions. And on the one side, we have these quantities. On the other side, we have a convex geometry tools. So we are essentially building a bridge between these two areas of uh, mathematics. So these are the two, two areas about the convex geometry, which I'm going to talk about next. And broadly speaking, there are many interesting and deep connections between information theoretic inequalities and the convex geometry. For example, even Tom Cover himself had written a paper with Amir Dembo in the 90s about the connections between the brown minkowski inequality and uh, the entropy power inequality in information theory. However, even though Tom Cover was very interested in convex geometry, there were no indication that uh, he actually made some connection between geometry and uh, the really channel problem. So our work is the first uh, one which uh, made a rigorous connections between these two areas. So now, the, I want to talk about the first, first ingredient of the proof, which is approximation of convex bodies. So I think this is a, a very beautiful piece of mathematics, which may actually, this has already been used in many other areas as well. So I want to talk about the basic ideas and some applications. So roughly speaking, we can think of information measures as some functionals defined on the set of probability measures. So on the one side, we have some probability measures and I will represent these probability measures as some set colored in blue. And on the other side, I want to use tools from convex geometry. So I want to approximate this set in blue using some uh, convex sets. And you know, convex set can be defined as the intersection of some half spaces. So, so in this figure, the, the right convex set is uh, the intersection of some half spaces. It is this uh, polygon. I'm not going to tell you how rigorously defined this convex set associated with, associated with this measure. Uh, but um, I just want to tell you that uh, if you look at this problem closely, it turns out that the mathematical core of this problem is to is that uh, given a convex body, we want to approximate it using another convex body, which has a small number of vertices. 
and uh, how to characterize the approximation of two convex bodies. We know how to say two numbers are similar. The difference is small, right? But uh, what about the two convex sets? Can we characterize the difference between sets? So there are some notions about a Hofdorf, Hofdorf distance for, for sets, but uh, here actually we'll use another distance, which is a, a tailor made for studying convex geometry, which is called a Banach mother distance. So you know a Banach space can be characterized using the, the unit ball in the Banach space. And the unit ball is always a convex set. So essentially this distance is a, a distance for two convex sets in the high dimensional space. So I can describe the, the idea of Banach mother distance using some pictures. Suppose that I have a, a unit ball. I want to approximate it using a, a polygon. So maybe first I can try to approximate using a triangle. And how to say that a triangle can be approximated by a, a ball. So what is the distance? What is the notion of distance between the circle and the triangle? So the definition we you are using here is um, is that we first uh, draw the largest triangle inscribed in this ball and suddenly we find the largest ball inscribed in this triangle so of course there are some ratio larger than one the ratio the ratio of the two radiuses so if that radius, uh, so if that ratio is small, is if that ratio is close to one, then the distance is very close to zero. So essentially, we we take the log of the, the ratio. That is the the Banach mother distance. And I can also approximate a circle using a, a rectangle. So I I do a, a similar process to calculate the distance. I draw a rectangle inscribed in the ball and then draw a ball inscribed in the rectangle and then calculate the, dis the ratio of these two circles. And now it is not hard to say, to see that uh, the ratio in this case is smaller than the ratio in this case. So this means that the Banach mother distance between a, a rectangle and uh, the circle is smaller than a Banach mother distance between a triangle and a circle. So, you can see what is going on here with the more and more vertices. You can get a better and better approximations of the a given convex body. So in general, the question is in high dimensions, what is the trade-off between the, the, the level of approximation and the number of vertices? And let me also comment that by duality, this question is equivalent to asking how to approximate a convex body using another convex set with a small number of facets. So in this case, a triangle has three faces in the same as the number of vertices. But uh, for high dimensions, there is a notion of polar sets of a convex body. So the, the number of facets for the polar is the same as the number of vertices in the original convex polytope. So these are two equivalent questions. So when I worked on uh, Covers problem. I first uh, solved this question for a specific case when this uh, ball is actually a, 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 a cube. And then I can do some uh, explicit calculations for the, the trade off between the approximation. But then uh, I learned that there's a very beautiful paper by Bavinok called The Thrifty Approximations of Convex Body by Polytopes. This is a very uh, nice paper using a beautiful proof techniques. You, you may be interested in to take a look at it. It's a very short paper. And it is uh, related to many interesting other topics like uh, John's ellipsoid and uh, uh, tensor power trick. So I can explain the idea of John's ellipsoid using some pictures. So for a given convex set, Suppose that my convex set is this uh, polygon, and then I can draw a maximum ellipsoid contained in this convex set. 
So maybe the maximum volume ellipsoid is this one. Max volume ellipsoid. And then this ellipsoid will make contact with the, the convex body at a few points. In this case, maybe there are four contact points. So let's call it X1, X2, X3, X4. So suppose that the, the maximum volume the ellipsoid is given by this uh, formula x transpose times sigma x trans, uh, times x is smaller than one. You can represent any centered ellipsoid using this uh, formula, right? Because um, essentially the, the angle lectures of this uh, semi-definite matrix sigma are the principal radiuses of the principal directions of the ellipsoid and the angle values of sigma are the, are the um, okay, sigma transpose. The angle values are the, the radius squared of the ellipsoid. And then uh, if you have a assumption that this uh, ellipsoid is maximum, then you can derive the following important property, which is that there exist some numbers, A1 to A4 such that some AI, XI, X times XI transpose is equal to two sigma. So this is not hard to derive basically from the uh, Lagrange multiplier method. You have some constraints that this is inscribed in the convex body, and then you want to maximize the the volume, and then you, you can get this. So this is a is a, also a condition in geometric Raskin Lieb inequality. So basically, using this construction, you are uh, finding a smaller convex body contained in the original convex body. The the new convex body are just the convex hull of these contact points. So you can imagine that these contact points are is a approximation of the original convex body. And then you may wonder, how do I get a better approximation? So this is just gives you a one approximation of the convex body, but cannot get a, a if I am allowed to, to use more vertices, cannot get a better, better approximation of the original convex body. So that is uh, how the tensor power trick uh, how tensor power trick is used. Using this uh, tensor power trick, you can lift the problem to a higher dimension. So then you can get another extra parameter so that you can get a trade-off between the approximation level and uh, the number of vertices. Okay, so uh, this, uh, these techniques are very useful in many other problems like uh, some problems in convex geometry called Halley's theorem. And also in data science and uh, graph theory, there is something called a spectral sparsifier of some graph or some matrix. Basically it's like given a, a matrix, positive semi-definite matrix here, you want to find the, you, you want to approximate it using the sum of rank one matrices. So this gives you a way to represent it using a sum of rank one matrices. And also in high dimensional CLT, this can be useful because you can first prove some high dimensional CLT for, for half spaces. And then once you get the bounds for half spaces, you can get bounds for intersection of half spaces, which is the, the bound for convex polytopes, which has only a few vertices. But if you know by this paper that uh, you can approximate any arbitrary convex body with another convex body with a few vertices, then you are done. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, another ingredient of the proof, which is mixed volumes and uh, the connection to empir empirical processes. 
in probability theory, this is called the expected supremum of stochastic process. So in high dimensional probability, you may know the, the so-called Sudakov minoration, which is very useful. And uh, in geometry, there are, there are also notions of isoparametric inequalities. The isoparametric inequality says that given a fixed volume of the convex body, the unit ball, min the, the ball minimized the, the surface area. And for the, the mean width, there's a similar inequality. So in a three-dimensional case, the, the volume is a three-dimensional volume. The surface area is a two-dimensional notion of volume. And the, the mean width is a notion of one-dimensional volume. The mean width is defined as the, the width of this convex body and then take the average over the directions. So for each direction, you take the width and then take the average. That is the mean, mean width. The mean width can be defined using this way. So you take Y to be uniform on the unit sphere and then this expected supremum is the, the mean width of the set A. And then the volume of the, a, uh, the set A can be upper bounded in terms of the, the mean width. And there are some dimension factor one over N on the exponent. This is uh, slightly different than the standard Sudakov inequality. In the standard Sudakov inequality, there is no dimension one over N. And also you express it using the packing number, uh, which is like the, the covering number of the set. However, the, the packing number is very closely related to the, the volume. And also how do you get rid of the dimension? Well, you use the johnson linux truss argument. You can embed a, a set of points into a, a, dim, a, a linear space whose dimension is logarithm in the number of points. So using this uh, dimension reduction argument, you can distill this the standard form of um, Sudakov inequality from this uh, above dimension dependent version. By the way, if you take uh, any textbook on high dimensional probability, Nowadays, the, the most standard proof for Sudakov's inequality is based on Gaussian comparison. That is a very specialized Gaussian specific proof. It only works for Gaussian measure. Uh, but uh, later I'm going to say that uh, this uh, geometric approach has some potential of extension to, to more general measures beyond the case of Gaussian measures. And that is uh, connected to some interesting open problems in probability. And, or so-called empirical process. So the basic idea of uh, using Minkowski inequality to give a geometric proof for Sudakov is uh, summarized in this slide. So basically we want to show the, the inequality on this previous slide. To show this, I, well, first I define this uh, supremum as A, expect this supremum as A. I want to find an inequality between A and the volume of the set A. And then I used the, the observation that if I take the Minkowski sum of K and some small convex set, then the new volume is approximated by the original volume of the ball plus some additional increment. And that increment is the precisely capture, cap, captured by the, the mean width of the, the convex set. And then on the other side, by the Brown Minkowski inequality, we know that the volume of the Minkowski sum is lower bounded by the volume of individual convex bodies. So, combining these two, we get some relationship between the volume and the, the mean width, which is A. And here, this uh, volume of K is just the volume of the, the unit ball, which is a constant. Okay, so uh, basically, with this and the somewhat additional arguments, we get. Uh, the Sudakov's inequality. And this can be generalized to arbitrary convex distance. So if you take K in the previous slide not to be a unit ball, but uh, some arbitrary convex set, then with some appropriate new notions of convex distance instead of the L2 distance for the packing number. And also uh, if you take the, the distribution of Y to not be on the uniform on the unit ball, but some measure depending dependent on the, the convex body, which is called the cone volume measure. 
then you, this the proof still works. This is a classical paper by Pasteur. This is a, also actually in French. So I initially did not notice that this is already published. So I so essentially I rediscovered this uh, during the work on converse problem. So I wanted to mention some open problem about empirical process related to this uh, pseudo cost inequality. So motivated by classical works of telegram on the measurization, um, measurizing measure theorem, there's some well-known con conjecture of whether Sudakov's inequality can be extended to more general log concave measures. Is uh, I will not mention the details, but uh, the conjecture can be found in this paper by Latella and uh, is a quite short statement. However, it is still open. And uh, one approach to solving, a potential approach to solving this conjecture is uh, in this paper. They basically combined the the geometric argument as well as the the Lindstrom's argument for dimension reduction to get uh, some extension to log concave measures, but it's still open in the a general case. It is solved in some important special case of log concave measures, but it's still open in general. And in the in the last slide, let me mention a few other topics that I worked on, which is somewhat related to this. Well, first, convex geometry can be applied into problems in high dimensional regression as well. For example, previously, I worked on uh, uh, the phase transition problem in, in uh, compressed sensing, and uh, we used the Gaussian width and uh, the similar tools like uh, Gordon's theorem, comparison theorem to, to give bounds for the phase transition point. And this type of results can be, I mean, this type of uh, high dimensional regression asymptotics can be used for, for some applications such as false discovery rate control or uh, confidence, high dimensional confidence interval. And there are also some potential future research directions related to this. For example, convex geometry has been uh, played a role in the complex hierarchies. You know, convex optimization problems are not all have the same complexity. The linear regression is the, the simplest and uh, semi-definite programming is slightly harder. There are harder convex optimization problems so one active areas of research this days is to to find the connections between the complex computation complexity and uh, notions of complexity in convex geometry like Gaussian width. So I, I'd like to work on this more in the future, and uh, I also worked on the connections between high dimensional probability and information theory during my graduate studies. For example, in my thesis, I proposed uh, some novel methods for, for giving information theoretic converses using reverse hypercontractivity and Braskem deep inequalities. These are not some specialized problems in information theory. These are pretty much in the central, central questions in information theory. And we essentially found uh, a, generic, a generic method for many information theory problems. And from this, we, we solved some open problems in multi-user information theory. And by the way, this is the same Tom Cover who asked the question about Rayleigh channel. For the future work, uh, it, is, it is very likely that uh, these techniques can be used for some st statist statistical inference problems like uh, group testing. And last year in September, I also presented a seminar in our department about distributed learning, in particular non-parametric statistics, the trade-off between the minimax risk, minimax rate, and communication complexity. So this is also a, 
uh, problem of interest for the future work, namely the distributed learning and federated learning. Okay, so with that, I'd like to conclude my talk. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Can you go back to the slide by the by embedding some geometry set shape into some the other geometry? So tell me which slide it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, this yeah. One? So like how do you uh, measure the, the the shape I'm embedding is the best one? Uh how do what do you mean by best one? I mean like Say, say for the for the circle, mm -hmm. we're, we're embedding a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, does it have to be like uh, like isosceles triangle or let's say any other triangle? Like how do you how do you know that this is the best one? Like, uh, in this case, I think is uh. So you take all possible. I think this. And mm -hmm. Then take the uh, take the smaller circle and then take the ratio. So. In this case, I think the equilateral triangle is uh, the optimal. So the question is, find a, so given num the number of vertices that you can use, find the best approximation of the, the ball. So I think in this two dimension case, it is just the, the uh, equilateral polygon. The, so you yeah. have this uh, number of vertices and then find the best one. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 to, 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 to try to figure out these uh, convex shapes, uh, what are some good real world applications of something like these? Uh, applications of this? Yeah. Yeah, uh, like I said, there's some uh, work on spectral sparsifier. So, which means that uh, given a graph, you know, there are some notion of graph Laplacian defined for a graph. And then you want to find a sparser graph, which has uh, approximately the same graph, graph Laplacian. So, so the method is to uh, find a, a low rank approximation of that matrix. That's, that's, that's yeah. This is just one example. So, so is there really any way you should want to simplify the uh, using? This is like a dimension reduction technique. Thank you, Professor, to introducing us to this interesting field. Uh, let's thank you. Uh, the pizza are here, so uh, Next up, we have one of our friends, uh, Jesse. Uh, he is a third year PhD student uh, And he works with Dr. Uh, so, uh, I'm Jesse. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, there's enough uh, time for you, but also uh, enough attention so we can yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. through each other and the pizza. Please, everyone, uh, the pizza's hot. Go at it. Yes, my Thank you. But this is just microphone for the recording, right? It's not just, uh, no, it's the microphone connected to the mic. But why is, it the, why is the sound not coming from here?
All right. So first, uh, what are dependent link? So uh, I want to start off by discussing what dependent link class models are. And I'm going to go through uh, three world world, real world applications. So the, the idea here is to make you interested in the research. It's not necessarily to go through any specific proofs. Working. No, it's not working. Cables are not that long. Not that long? Okay. All right. Okay. So, all right. So, oh, the, the, the idea around latent class models is, is a form of unsupervised clustering. So, the goal is you're going to give some sort of multiple choice, uh, multiple choice survey out to people. They're going to fill it out and we want to group the people who, who answer based off of their responses. Um, so a, a good example here, you might think of a personality test. That, that, that's a pretty common use case. So a, a traditional latent class model, so the, the, this is prior research, uh, looks as follows. So what we have here are good students and poor students and good students in this case, we have a six question quiz, which we gave our students. And the good, the good students have an 80% chance of getting any individual question right. The four students only have a 40% chance of getting these questions right. And there, there's an assumption of conditional independence. And so with conditional independence, a good student answers each of these questions independently. So the probability of getting all these questions correct if you're a good student it's just 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8 and so on. So the issue here is that this assumption of conditional independence is actually a really strong assumption. So, uh, and this comes uh, dependently in class models. So the, the idea here is to look for related questions and correct for that. So, um, and uh, in this example here, perhaps five, questions five and six, are actually a two-part question. Um, and, and so what we want to do is want to allow for dependence. So in this case here, if you get question five correct, you very likely get question six correct. And if you get question five wrong, you very likely get question six wrong. And one way to think of uh, these probabilities here is as a transformation to your data set. So in our original data, we have one row per person who answered, one if they got the question right, zero if they got the question wrong. And we, we have these uh, six questions. So uh, on the right, we have a transformed data set where we combined questions five and six. So we, we, we have, if you get them both right, that, that's a value of three. If you get them both wrong, that's a value of zero. If you get the first one right and the second one wrong, that's a value of two. And, and then the goal here, is, is to have one value for each pair of values between these two questions. And, and in this setup, we have one probability for, for each value here. And we now again have conditional independence because this is independent from the rest of these. So in this last case, this sort of transformation is something you could do manually. You can say, okay, questions five and six are related let me sort of merge these into the same column and deal with it that way. But what this dependent latent class model does is it stochastically searches for what that correct grouping is. And for those groupings, it goes through and estimates those uh, corresponding probabilities. And it does that in a, in a Bayesian framework. So we do Bayes MCMC. And so um, we, we have a number of iterations in each iteration, we try to uh, generate uh, related questions, generate the response probabilities for those questions, um, identify um, how common or, or uncommon the different classes are, and figure out which person belongs to which class. And we just repeat this over and over and over and over until we, we have a good understanding of the distribution of our model parameters. So uh, our first example here is an experiment in education. So uh, there was an experiment where they did a pre-post design. 
So they gave the students a 12 probability questions. They gave them a certain treatment and they gave them a, a post-test. Sorry, the, 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 second, the second thing, my apologies, should say a post-test um, where uh, the questions of the post-test were almost identical to the original problems with some slight changes to the numbers or the labels or that sort of thing. And if you go and run our model on this, you find the following groupings. So first, we, we group together certain paired questions. And second, we group together some of the tougher questions uh, from the pretest, which you might need certain specialized probability knowledge to know. Uh, so, so some of the paired questions were, were not grouped together because uh, these questions for whatever reason, it wasn't too important to, to put them together. They, they were close to independence. And if you take a look at the goodness of fit here, so you notice two things. So, so we're looking here at the WAIC. So this is a measure of how well um, our model fits the data, uh, plus a penalty for how complicated the model is. And the, the, the lower the value, the better. And our, our new model uh, has a uh, significantly stronger goodness of fit. And it's a less complicated model. So we, we have a less complicated model, which performs much better. And so we, we can see here that, that at least in this example, our dependent LCM does really well in pre-post testing. So our, our second example here is a longitudinal study in medicine. So in this case, uh, we have infants and every six months they're going to the doctor and the doctor checks to see whether or not they have itchy rashes, flex derma, night cough, and wheezing. And when we run our model on this, any sort of grouping is possible. So, so it's possible to group itchy rash across time points. It's possible to, to get dependence between flex derma and night cough between time points. There's sort of any sort of grouping here is possible. But what the model finds is that the skin conditions are typically grouped together and the lung conditions are also typically grouped together. And you notice this is a bit different from the previous example. So the previous example, we found relationships between time points. Here, we're finding relationships within time points. So we're seeing some good flexibility here. Again, the goodness of fit is uh, much stronger than, than the your traditional model. And we're able to fit with, with far fewer classes. I, I bet you that the traditional model would probably need much more than six in this case. The, these six classes aren't very interpretable. So um, we, again, we have a simpler and better fit and we, we see some good effectiveness in time series. Our, our third example, which we'll get into a little more detail for this one is a sociological survey. So, so here, this is a CDC survey of high school women. Uh, it's called a YRBS survey. And uh, here we're specifically looking at the questions related to sexual assault and sexual risk taking. And if we go and take a look at the goodness of fit here, um, again, much less complicated, better goodness of fit. And we see here that our best model uses three classes. Um, in this case, we're, we're differentiating between two types of dependent models. So the, the first type is your homogeneous model. In the homogeneous model, these groups are the same for all relating classes. In the heterogeneous model, these groups could vary from class to class. And, and so here, here's an example of, of some of the dependent questions here. So the, the first question is, last time you had sex, did you use a condom? Second question is, the last time you had sex, what method did you use to prevent pregnancy? And you see that we have three classes here. So, so, so one class is, is a class zero, it's called at risk. So they, these are people who are either um, potentially being abused or have other sorts of uh, risk taking. We have a second class, which is the largest class of not sexually active. And a third class of sexually active. And you notice that 
if, if, if I said that I use a condom, then in question 65, I'm very likely saying, yes, I used a condom. Or if, if I say I did not, then I'm typically using other sorts of methods. Um, so so the, here's a case where we have two questions on the same topic. And in order to have a good uh, measure of fit, um, you, you need to look at the relationship between those two questions. If we go and compare this with our traditional model, one of the reasons why it needs six classes is because it takes each one of these individual classes and breaks it into two, one class of condom users, and one class of not condom users. So it sort of doubles the complexity to, to really just handle two, uh, one pair of related questions. A, 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 uh, another case of related questions here is, is something called structural zeros. So that this one has to do with uh, sexual abuse. So uh, question 20, um, how many times in the past 12 months has anyone uh, sexually abused you? And second question, question 21, in the past 12 months, how many times did somebody you were dating sexually abuse you? And, well, and of course, anyone is gonna be typically larger than people you're dating. So if everything tends to be in the lower triangle here. Uh, with ju just a, a few anomalies uh, on the top here. And so in conclusion, uh, dependent LCMs, it's a method of unsupervised learning to group similar responses together in uh, multivariate categorical data, like a personality test or a multiple choice survey. And it, it, it stochastically searches for which questions are related and corrects for that. Uh, we've discussed some good applications, time series pre-post testing, overlapping questions and structural zeros. And it, we have it available in an easy to use R package. Any questions? Yep, go ahead. Can you go to the slides of the FDMC? Of the what? MCMC. MCMC, yeah. So I think uh, you are doing latent class. So you will assign latent labels you, yes. Yeah. So do you encounter label switching in your MCMC sample? So uh, label switching is pretty uncommon. Uh, this example here did have some label switching, which, which I had to go through and correct for. And what, one common way to handle that is, um, uh, so, so, so you start by taking a look at, um, uh, which, which I had to wait for here. Imagine we have one row per person and one column representing the class chosen for that person from each iteration. So, so, so for, for a given row, we, we can find what the mode or the, the most common class is for that person. But then what we do is we, we, we go column by column and we ask ourselves what relabeling of that column makes it more, most similar with that mode. And we would go and we would do that relabeling. Then we go to the end, we update the mode and we go through it again until there's no more changes. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. So uh, how do you decide repeat until we understand like these values? So you must use some kind of convergence diagnostics, right? What, what do you use? Yeah, so I, I mean, to, to, to typically, I, I just use relatively large number of iterations, so around 6,000, but, but then that's really a starting point. I, I go and conver, uh, confirm the convergence with a gum and ribbon diagnostic. Oh, okay. I, I also do some, some diagnostic plots of like densities and things, but it's, it's really going urban. Thank you. Hmm. Yep. Uh, tell me if I'm getting this right. Uh, one of the first things you do is you try to find an optimal partition of the covariate set of the questions, right? Um, well, the, 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 the questions aren't covariate, the responses. The responses, oh, oh so, okay, the responses themselves. Wait, hold on, hold on. So, what are the rows and what are the columns here? What are considered the observations? Is it the individuals who take the tests or is it the questions? Um, so, 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 so if you think about your data matrix, you can have one row per individual, one column per question. Sure. And all those questions are treated as Y, none as X. Mm -hmm. Okay, but here you're flipping it because the observations are now taken to be. So, so question one, that becomes one of my N observations. Uh, no, subject one would be one if you're in observation. Okay, yeah, yeah. So then you are partitioning the covariate set of questions. Yeah, we're, we're partitioning the questions. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. All right. So 
Uh, yeah, so you find an optical partition. That mm -hmm. sounds great. You know, mm -hmm. an, an exact solution would be hard. So you have some sort of regularization. Oh, oh, oh uh, no. So, so um, if we're doing this in the frequency test setting, then, then we, we would be trying to find the optical partition. Um, in this case, we're doing it in the Bayesian setting. So we, we don't really find a optimal solution. We, we more jump between latex solutions. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a, I see. Yes. No, 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 in practice, uh, that there is typically one solution, which is by far the most common and most likely. And we spend maybe 80% of our time in that particular location. Got it, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was gonna say optimization can be done in the Bayesian way. It's not, it doesn't fail the optimization. Yeah, and, 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 and in terms of regularization, well, one of the things which uh, you gotta be really careful about with this is um, as follows. So I, I can always take this model and make it more complicated. So, so, so I, I can take these two questions and say merge them together. And, and, and now I'm gonna have uh, more possible probabilities because instead of doing, or let, let's say these four together, because I have two times two times two times two different patterns for those four questions. So the, the question is, why do I choose this over something which merges these four? Uh, so, so since they, they both have sort of the, the same, you can generate the same uh, posterior. So the, 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 sorry, I shouldn't say posterior. You can generate the same uh, probability of X from both a more complicated model and a simpler model. Follow me so far? Yeah, you go with the simpler. Uh, oh, so, so, so we, we have a carefully constructed prior, which biases it towards a simpler. So that way, even if there are more complicated models, which fit just as well, we say all is equal when you choose that simpler model. Nice. Okay, so is the regularization at least partly in the prior? Entirely in the prior. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, and then very last thing I'll ask, could this be extended for uh, 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 something beyond a partition of the covariate space? Like what if you had the covariate space, but you chopped it up like you were overlapping uh, subsets? Okay, so um, we, we allow for different classes to have different sort of groupings uh, and, and that, that creates some sort of overlap or, or class one and class two disagree. So you have some sort of overlap here. Okay. Now, within a specific class, uh, we do not currently allow that. Um, what you could potentially do is um, so sort of strategically, if, if two are overlap, first find like the overlapping probabilities and then say conditional on this, find those other parts. But it, it gets rather complicated, especially since you can have all sorts of different types of overlaps. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Oh, oh. Uh, you just mentioned how your new method is a lot simpler than the traditional complex method, right? Um, I saw that on the slide. Well, well, so if we take a, like, let's say three class model, here. So my three class model and their three class model, mine is going to be more complicated because you have all these different possible groupings. However, since you don't have those groupings, you have to compensate by more classes. So, so you end up with a larger w, uh, like AIC penalty. I see. Okay. So that, that's what I'm talking about for simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first part, like when we have the when we have decided that these are the columns and they might not be dependent, so we are only looking for dependencies among the samples, right? Um, like you are trying to group uh, those samples which might be similar to each other. For example, some questions which might be similar to each other. Yep. But wait, but the question is the covariate, right? Yeah, so, 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 so you, 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 your question is your response. So, so, so there are two types of groupings here. So, 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 so we, we have the classes we would, we would try the groups of people. So, so the, the, those group responses. And, and, and then we have these, what we call these domains, which group questions together. Okay, so, so, so I mean, the, the, the basic idea is we, 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 uh, we, we were grouping these people between like good students and poor students, right? Um, but, 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 but then we have to account for um, the, the, the fact that question five and six are related. Right, so is it like related to finding which covariates are correlated to each other uh, like in, a, in a given model fitting problem? 
certain covariates might be yes. close to each other. Right? Yeah, yeah. You, both of them, then... Yeah, you, you think of it in terms of like linear regression, having a non-identity uh, sigma for your, for your errors? Right. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask a follow up. Uh, let's go back to the NTMC slides again. All right. So uh, I think, uh, do you decide the number of latent cards in advance before you do the MCMC? Yeah, so, so, so it's assume it's fixed. Yeah, so uh, have you ever or try to compare like reverse, reversible jump model? Um, so the, the issue with that sort of jump model is um, you don't necessarily have a, a generic identifiability. So, 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 um, so if, if you compare like a two class model and like a three class model, the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 the three class model, the two class model is really special case if you three class. So, so, so you lose identifiability. So when one of the things we really focus on this it is verifying the generic identifiability of this model over across all possible groupings. And you lose that if you do those jumps. Thank you. Hmm. You can always find Jesse around. And yep. He'll be happy mm -hmm. to answer your questions as long as you don't scare him. So let's <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's... Okay. Next up, we have uh, one of our friends, Men Cheng. Uh, she works with Professor Bowley. Um, and today she'll be talking about this interesting kind of data explanation. So let's welcome Men Cheng. Is the microphone just to uh, clip it on? Yeah, this is on. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to use this one. Okay, great. So, hello everyone. I'm Meng Chen Wang. I'm a fourth year PhD student. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and today I would like to talk about my joint work with Trevor and Bo. The title is Asynchronous Change Point Estimation for Spatially Correlated Functional Time Series. Um, so first I would like to introduce the change point. Change point detection, change point detection and estimation. Usually people work in this area in uh, time series, functional time series. So many of the methods fell into two categories. One is at most one change, it means there is one change point or there is no change point. The other category is multiple change points. So in, so in this figure, uh, it represents a multiple change point example. Uh, for example, this is the first change point. This is the second one. Uh, in this example, the change point is in mean and also variance. Uh, early methods for time series are based on the cumulative sum statistic. Uh, this is for the time series. Uh, and for the, for the functional time series, uh, it is slightly different because for the time series at one time point, you will have only one data point. But for the functional time series, for one data time point, you will have a whole function. For example, in this figure, I represent a sequence of functional time series. Uh, here, I think we have 10 curves. So for example, we have 10 years, uh, then this would represent uh, the data in one year, and we have 10 curves in this plot. So early change point detection in this area focus on the at most one change. One recent paper, OS paper, they proposed a fully functional method for finding a change in the mean. So uh, we will mainly uh, compare our results with the method, with this method. And what we are working on is the spatially indexed functional time series. It means we will observe the functional time series at some spatial locations so it is very common for environmental data because we really collect the data for a lot of spatial locations and we would expect some uh, correlation between them. Uh, a recent paper in Gromenko's paper, uh, they assume a common break time, I mean the change point for all functional time series over the spatial domain and develop a test statistic. 
but they assume a common break time. So it can be unrealistic if the spatial region is very large. Uh, we did this, we explore this by a data, exa a data example. So we collect the daily minimum temperature in some weather stations in California from 1971 to 2020. And we use the FF to test if there is a change point. Uh, then we implement F FDR control and further determine the rejection region. Here is the plot. So it represents the locations of the weather stations and the corresponding change points. So we can see uh, it is hard to believe they will share the same change point. Uh, and it seems there is some spatial correlation. So in my project, we would like to pr propose an asynchronous change point estimation method for the spatially indexed functional time series. Our method will allow the change point to vary spatially, uh, to be spatially uh, varying. So this is called asynchronous. And also we will allow the amount of change to be different for different locations. Uh, in our problem, we will focus on the at most one change and only the change in the mean. Our method will approximate the functional Q sum based process with a piecewise linear model with some variance function. And we will specify all parameters in a Bayesian hierarchical model to consider the spatial correlation. So first, let me briefly introduce the notation here. We use X uh, STU be the functional observation at location S and time point T. Uh, this is an example of the functional time series. Uh, this, since this is at one location, so I delete the spatial index S here. So we will have capital T curves and each curve is a function about U. If again, we use the daily temperature example, suppose we observe the daily temperature at Champagne for 50 years, then capital T would be 50 and we will have 50 curves in the functional time series. Each curve would be the daily temperature over one year. So this is uh, January the 1st. Uh, this is the end of this year. The first curve X1 represents the daily temperature data in the first year and X2 is the daily temperature data in the second year. Okay, so let's move on to the model. Uh, we assume the functional time series at location S is generated from this following model. So this is the observation and this is the mean curve. So before the change point K star, it will be spatially varying. So we add the spatial index here. Before the change point, the observation is the mean function plus some error function. After the change point, we will have another change function. So if in this uh, example for the red curves, they are the functional data before the change point. Uh, we can see they share our same mean function. For the blue curves, they are the ones after the change function. So we can see uh, in this one, the change function is quite obvious. So we can tell it easily. Um, so this is the background of our functional time series. We also have some assumptions for our errors, the epsilon on this part. We assume for each location they are weakly dependent, identically distributed, and also have mean zero second order stationary. So what does change point detection mean? Actually, it is a hypothesis testing. So at each location, if the change function is a zero function, then it is a null location. Otherwise, it is an alternative location. So this is the change point detection. Then I need to introduce the functional cumulative sum. So the formula looks like this. Uh, K is the time point. Uh, I mean, if in the temperature data, it, it means the year. So K can take value from zero to capital T. Following this formula, we can see uh, this is the sum of the first k functional data and uh, k over capital T. This is uh, k times the average, uh, like the mean function of all the functional data. 
So after the calculation for each k, we can get a function about u. And following the definition, we can see when k is zero or capital T, it would be a exactly zero function. Why is this QSAM so important? So in OS paper, I just mentioned this one didn't consider spatial correlation. Uh, they, their method is based on a test statistic like this. So this is the functional QSAM in the previous slide. They take the L2 norm with the square and get where it gets the maximum. So their estimator is uh, where the QSAM based process gets the maximum. They also have a minimum here to just to find the earliest time it gets the peak. In Gramenko's paper, this one is the one that shares the common break time for all locations. Uh, it is slightly different because they have some weights here to influence, the, to, to respect the spatial correlation. But we can see the form still form uh, is similar to the QSAM process. So uh, from these examples, we can see QSAM uh, statistic is very powerful, uh, not only in the univariate time series, but also in the functional time series. So in our method, we would also implement the QSAM as, as our building block. Similar as before, we take the L2 norm with a square and K come from zero to capital T. From the definition when K is zero or capital T, it is exactly zero. Here, zero is um, zero, not a zero function, because we already use the L2 norm to convert into a real number. In this way, we can reduce the functional sequence at one location. Um, in our, this slide, the functional time series. Into one single time series, like in this plot. So this would be our k, k from zero to, uh, k to capital T, but we use a scaled time, so it's zero to one. And this is the y process. So further, we study the properties of this y dk process. Uh, we use lambda l and phi l be the eigenvalues and then the functions of the error process. Q be the scaled time point, uh, k over capital T. Then we have a lemma under the null hypothesis when there is no change point. Uh, so we can find the uh, distribution of this YTK process uh, and uh, another process which is related to the Brownie bridge. Uh, we can skip this one for a while. Oh. <laughs> Uh, let's look at the proposition, uh, the result when there is one change point, k star, uh, and the change function is delta. So y is the y process we are interested in. C is another process. We can find the relationship between these two process. Uh, there is a square root here. We can easily calculate the expectation and variance of this C process. Let's first look at the uh, mean part. So we can divide it into two pieces. One is before the change point, the other is after the change point. The first part is, uh, this is a scalar. This is related to the time. It's a quadratic function. And the second part, we'll have a very interesting parameter here, which is the squared L2 norm of the change function. So we can see uh, if, uh, based on our assumption for the error function, all the locations will share the same lambda L. In this way, if the change function for some location is very obvious, the second one will, the second part will be very large. It would lead to a very high peak for this location. I mean, the peak of the Y process is very high, of the uh, Z process is very high. Uh, so it starts from zero, ends at the zero, I mean, the, the uh, mean of this C process. It starts from zero, ends at zero, and gets the peak right at the change point. For the variance, it is slightly, dif uh, slightly different. Um, 
but the form looks quite similar with two pieces, uh, each with very complicated form. So it, the variance also starts from zero and ends at zero, but uh, it really gets the maximum value in the medium, not exactly at the change point. For this variance, we have two parameters. One is A, which is also, also related to the error process. And another is B. Uh, it is related to the error process, but also uh, with the change function. So from our result, we can see uh, we can assume all locations share the same parameter A, this one. And for the B parameter, since it is related to the change function, we will only say they can be spatially varying. Then we propose to use the mean and variance of this C process to approximate those of the Y process. Since from our proposition, though it seems they have a very close relationship, but to use directly useful Z process to approximate Y is not a viable solution, I mean, in theory. So we further do some simulations uh, in four different settings. Uh, the first row represents the mean, the second row represents the variance, and the blue curve represents the result from our simulation, I mean the Y process, and the, the red dashed line represents the result about the Z process. So we can see in all these four different settings with different change signal and different number of time points, the approximation is very wide. So we will just use the results from Z process to approximate those of Y process. Then about the mean part, since the YTK process, it starts from zero and then zero and gets the peak right at the change point. So we will just use a piecewise linear model with two pieces to fit the mean of this Y process. Because uh, the two ends are exactly zero, uh, we can see the piecewise linear model can be modeled by only one slope parameter. And the other parameter is where the two pieces meet. Because again, from our property, uh, the stronger the change signal is, the higher the peak of this process is. I mean, the higher the mean, the peak of the mean is. So uh, we will think the, the slope would be steeper. In this plot, we show uh, how the piecewise model fit. Um, the red curve and the blue curve uh, are two examples of the Y process. The red dashed line and blue dashed line represent the piecewise linear fit with our variance form from the theoretical result. If we directly take where it gets the peak, as in Alexander's paper, the blue one has change point here. The red one has change point here. The black uh, vertical line represents where the true change point is. So we can see if we didn't take the uncertainty, the variance right, the change point can be very far from the real result. After we use the piecewise linear model, it becomes closer to the real result. So this is how our piecewise linear model work. Then because we would expect uh, near uh, locations would have similar break time, the change point, and also the change function. In our piecewise linear model, the break time is modeled by the intersection of these two pieces. And the amount of change is modeled by the slope parameters. So we would expect these two parameters to be similar when the locations are near. For this are for the mean part of the Y process. For the various part, we will just use the theoretical result, the complicated form. And then let's go back, go to our Bayesian hierarchical model. Uh, since our model mainly works on the estimation part rather than the detection part, we will directly fit our model on the rejection region. So suppose we have capital N locations in the rejection region. For the Y process, we fit a piecewise linear model. Beta is the slope and C is the scaled change point. And we have an error term. For the error term, we give them some temporal and spatial correlation. For the variance part here, we just use the theoretical form. 
and recall from the uh, proposition in the virus part, we have two parameters. One is A, which is related to the error process. The other is B, which is spatially varying and related to the change function. For the beta, the slope, uh, since we expect uh, it to be increased first and then decrease, so it should be uh, uh, negative and uh, be spatially correlated. For the A and B S, we will treat them as some unknown parameters and let the model learn the value. We also assume the exponential variance covariance for the temporal and spatial correlation in the error part. Because uh, the shape of the piecewise linear model is influenced by the change function um, and also the change point. So to respect this fact, we will regulate beta, which is the slope of the piecewise linear model, and C, which is the change point uh, where the two pieces meet in the piecewise linear model by a correlated process. B is the parameter in the variance part, and it is also related to the change function. So we also uh, use a correlated process to model this one. Because the dependency, these three parameters all arise from the spatial dependency. So we will assume they share one common correlation matrix. Then let's go to the stage two of our model. Beta again is the slope, it is negative. So we use log minus beta to transform it to minus infinity to positive infinity. C is the scaled change point, it's between zero and one. So we use the inverse of the normal CDF of the normal distribution. A and B are both positive, so we use the log transformation. And we have the spatial correlation here for these two three parameters, um, they share the same form. For the other parameters like mu and sigmas for these parameters, we will give them some hyperpriors and let the model learn the value. So it is a very complicated model with three stages. Then we did some simulations or to evaluate the accuracy of our estimation and also the coverage and length of the credible interval. So to explore, to explore how the strength of the spatial correlation and change signal influence the performance, I will skip the details of the simulation Mainly in the generation, we have two parameters. One is this phi parameter, which is the range parameter we use to generate the change function and change uh, points. So it measures, it controls how strong the spatial correlation is. We still take the exponential covariance matrix. So if uh, phi is larger, it means the spatial correlation is stronger. And there is another parameter called rho, it controls the magnitude of the change function. So the higher this row is, the higher the change function, uh, the change signal is. We have four different settings with weak and strong spatial correlation and weak and strong change signal, um, like this. So we compare our results with the two methods, which is the FF, which ignore the spatial correlation. The other is the Gromenko's method, uh, they assume the common change, common change point. So the orange one, BH, is our method. So for, based on the RMSE of the change point, we can see our method has the best accuracy among all these four different settings. Uh, then we further compare our method only with the FF method because Gromenko's paper didn't provide their confidence interval. The first row against the RMSE of the estimate. The second row is the coverage of the credible interval. And the, the dashed line is the 95% nominal level. The last row is the log of the length of the credible interval. So we can see our uh, overall, our method performs much better than the FF method, uh, especially when we have stronger spatial correlation. If we compare the first column and second column, when the signal is weak, uh, when we have stronger spatial correlation, our performance performs much better. And when the change signal is already strong enough, the improvement is not that obvious. So these um, are the main results about 
uh, the simulation. Uh, let's further have a look at the, the credible interval. The orange one, again, is our credible yeah. interval. And uh, there is a cross, uh, in, maybe it is not that clear, it's estimated from our method. The blue ones are those re results from the fully functional method. There is also a black dot. Maybe it is also not that clear. It is the true change point. So we can see when the change point is in the middle, two methods perform very well. But when the change point are on the very edges, for example, this one, this one, our method is still able to capture it well, but the FF um, would have some difficulty. So overall, our method perform very well when the spatial correlation is strong. And also we are able to capture the change points on the edges. We also did some real data analysis. One is the California minimum temperature data. One is a COVID-19 data. I will skip this. Uh, so in summary, we develop a Bayesian hierarchical model based on the QSUM based process for change point estimation for spatially indexed functional time series. Uh, one thing different is we allow spatially varying change point and change functions. We formulate the problem into fitting a piecewise linear model with spatial correlation. So our work mainly work on the uh, change point estimation. So one further work would, uh, that would be interesting is to incorporate detection, the hypothesis testing, and also estimation in a single model. So this is also what I'm currently working on. So that's all of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Can you go back to that uh, proposition? Oh. So, uh, so what's the, can you just uh, use the original Y to, can you just uh, propose the model on Y? What was the problem of uh, uh, having to approximate Y with Z? Oh, because uh, for this Y, it has a very, we, we cannot write the form out really. So Z actually is a process related to the Brownian bridge like in the lemma. So we can easily calculate the expectation and variance. But for Y, it doesn't have a theoretical form. We can only say it has some relationship with this one. And the relationship is a square root, square root. And this is the convergence in probability. I also tried to prove if we can directly use this results to model Y, but it seems the, uh, the conditions are not strong enough. So this is the best result I can get. And uh, in, in theory, it seems we cannot directly say uh, Y would follow such distribution. So I have to use uh, an addition step to do some simulations to prove we can use the result to approximate Y process Y. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, before and after the change points, uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe you mentioned you're sitting that the same errors, the, 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 the same distribution of errors. Yeah, we, in this model, we need to assume uh, the error has is identically distributed. Okay. So their variance are not that different. Okay. So did, did you think it pose a problem for your model if mm -hmm. the errors change, if there was a wider at the change point? Errors, you, you, errors change. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the next one, error. Mm -hmm. Oh, this term, the error function, it is different for every time point. Yeah, yeah, no, mm -hmm. well, 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 what I'm saying is, uh, okay. But the, the, they're identically distributed each time, right? Yes. Oh, oh, yeah, our model, we need to assume the variance is stable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's like the whole assumption in our problem. We yeah. assume there is only one change point at most, mm -hmm. and uh, there is only a change in the mean. So yeah. for the variance part, we will assume they are always the same. I mean, yeah. follow so, the so, same so, distribution. So, uh, mm -hmm. so there the, the, the might be an issue with the model change. Is that, is that assumption is violated? 
I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, because uh, usually paper in such area, they directly apply their method to some real data analysis without any uh, methods to check if the assumptions are correct. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah. I want to go back to the, the conversation again. Why we only have a convergence for with the square root right now? Not maybe because of some tail of the. Oh, because our y is the L two norm, the squared L two norm. When I do the calculation, so one one step, I need to use the triangle inequality, but that one can only work for the norm. The square is uh, some function. The square. So square root. Uh, yeah, the square root would be directly the L two L two norm of some mm -hmm. function. So you only have a convergence for that, but not for the first step. So. Mm -hmm, right. At first, I made a mistake here and directly have a result without the square root. I'm very happy, but when I try to grab up the paper, I find the mistake. <laughs> it's like a disaster. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Okay, so uh, next time. Thank you. That concludes our seminar for today. Uh, if you are interested in presenting your work, please uh, contact Sian or Dave or me or my husband, anyone from. So this was the last semester, uh, sorry, last the seminar of this semester. And there will be, so this seminar will resume in fall and we need volunteers. So if you are interested in working in the seminar committee, just let us know. You can start from fall. And thank you for attending the seminars and maybe you'll start with. Thank you.